Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicharian, former NFL scout and now of Sports Info Solutions, joined by Aaron Schatz, the godfather of football analytics and the founder of Football Outsiders. We've got our producer, Justin Stein, with us. And coming off six wild card games, we're getting ready for the Elite Eight, the divisional round. Uh, Aaron, how was that for you? I know you got caught up in that Nickelodeon. Yeah, I, I I was tired by the end. I was so happy that Cleveland went out to such a huge lead. I was like, oh, I can take a nap now. And then Pittsburgh came back and was like, oh, I can't take a nap now. But uh, six games is a lot to do in one weekend, but we did have a lot of good football games. So that was exciting. I, I thought there were some good close games there. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. There were some weird fourth down decisions that I think um, have been talked about ad nauseum, Um, just head scratchers and then kind of head scratching announcing at certain points too. like to not understand that stuff at this point in the season is is a little bit infuriating. It's been said online and I will repeat it. It would be really good for the networks to have some kind of an analytics expert the way that they have an officiating expert who's in a studio who can comment on things like fourth down decisions or the whole go for two when you're down 14 and you score issue. Uh, I I volunteer to do it, of course, but, you know, it's not like ESPN doesn't have tons of people that could do it for them. I watched the the ESPN Plus broadcast that had the Vegas guys and then the NFL Live folks, and listening to Mina Kimes, like, actually understand analytics and talk about it was – just a breath of fresh air. Yeah, that was a fun one, certainly, that broadcast. I, what I really wanted was for them to put uh, Lewis Riddick together with Mina Kimes um, and Dan Orlovsky so that uh, he doesn't have to keep being infuriated by Brian Greasy the entire game because I, I, I listened to that one a bit too. Um, I like that. I like the CBS. And I liked uh, the, the national championship game. It was a blowout. But the analytics broadcast that ESPN did, their, their data center broadcast that they did as part of the mega cast with, with uh, people like Brian Burke and Paul Sabin, Seth Walder on it, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, well, they, ESPN opens things up with the mega cast idea. And I, you know, I would love to see more of that. But they're, I mean, they're the ones who have enough channels to do it. I suppose NBC could do it. They could throw something on NBC Sports Network and something on. Well, they're all conglomerates at this point, right? Like CBS went and literally threw it to Nickelodeon. Like there are a lot of options here. There are a lot of options. I'm surprised when I was growing up, it wasn't, there weren't like MTV games. I feel that feels like something that they would have tried. Rock and jock softball, but you know, that's a little different. All right, let's get into the game. By the way, I do think that's where it's headed. I think that that the way that people are going to absorb games is going to be different broadcasts for different audiences, but that, that's a different matter for a different day. We've got four huge games. This is usually the best weekend of football every year. Uh, a little bit different this year with just two of the teams having buys as opposed to four of the teams having buys. And that leads right into the first game of the weekend, 4.35 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. It'll be the six-seeded Rams with the best defense in the NFL against the number one-seeded Packers with the best offense in the NFL. But for me, the storyline is really this is a team coming off of a bye against a team without a healthy quarterback. Yeah, coming off of a bye, playing at home, a warm weather team playing on the road in road and cold weather. Uh, and add to that the fact that number one offense versus number one defense, except we know that one, offense is more predictive than defense, and two, the best offense is almost always stronger than the best defense. And it is in this case. I, I wanted to look into this and say, okay, what, what could go wrong for the Packers here? Because it feels like everything kind of points in their direction. And uh, one thing that stood out to me was uh, the Packers offensive line, which I know uh, led, I think, past block win rate and run block win rate on the, the ESPN metrics. They do well by SIS numbers too, uh, specifically Elton Jenkins, Corey Lindsley, and David Bakhtiari. But of course, Bakhtiari is done for the playoffs with his ACL injury. So I think that's the thing that if there's if there's a potential Achilles heel for the, the Packers team, I'm looking to see how they perform without him. Now, interestingly enough, the SIS on-off splits app which looks at how teams perform with and without players, shows that there hasn't been much of a statistical difference to the Packers' passing game without him this year, which is surprising because he's you know their left tackle. But it, it's been the run game that struggled when he was off the field for the, this year, which was several hundred snaps. 
So I thought uh, Leonard, Leonard Floyd was absolutely fantastic for the Rams last week. Obviously, all eyes are on Aaron Donald and how he comes back from the injury. Although I think uh, the Packers might actually, if, if there's any team that's equipped to deal with him, it is the Packers. Uh, but I'm looking at that left tackle position, and is it going to be Yasua Nijman playing left tackle? I, I, I don't, I don't even know what's going on there at this You're point. You're just picking Scrabble tiles out of a bag, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, because that's how often I've said that name before. But seriously, they were they were trying to sign the same player. Veld here who played for the Colts last week and he is on the COVID list now so who knows who's going to be in that spot for them yeah I think the other thing is I think is flipping around and looking at the other matchup the best case scenario for the Rams is that their defense sort of plays the Packers offense to a standstill right that the Packers score like 24 points you know like an average number of points because the two face off to a stand to best case is probably you score on defense some but but yeah you, we don't think they're going to hold them to three points all right so now so what can their offense do against the Packers defense we know the Packers defense is mediocre they're mediocre against both the pass and the run there's two things that I'm thinking of here one is if Wolford is healthy and plays instead of golf and it doesn't look like that's the case it now looks like Wolford hasn't practiced for a couple of days it looks like it's going to be gone if Wolford is healthy the zone read, right, the idea that maybe the Packers linebackers aren't fast enough to, to get after the zone read. But it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So the other big thing for them is getting their inside receivers, like Cooper Cup, lined up on linebackers. They'd have to do a lot of that, though, to outscore the Packers. Maybe uh, just to play a little bit of devil's advocate, maybe um, you look at the 49ers and the way that they've attacked the Packers, and you look at that as a blueprint for how the Rams could attack them, you know, similar to last year's playoffs. And it's what it's what the Rams and the Niners like to do. It's a lot of outside zone. That might be the best way to attack this defense. But I'm with you. I actually think that Wolford would would help more than Goff would in terms of the numbers and advantages that they would give if you're going to really attack running the ball because that the Packers secondary, I think, is is certainly their strength when you compare that to their front seven. You know, I wanted to circle back on last week with the whole Wolford thing. Did McVay start Wolford over a healthy Goff last week? No, but I think he started Wolford over an injured Goff. Do we think that there's a chance that McVay actually prefers Wolford to Goff? I think so, yes, especially given that Goff is injured. I think I think of it as Goff being benched because if your quarterback is 90% and he's healthy enough to be active, he starts. If he's your starting quarterback and he's healthy enough to be active, he starts. It's really, really rare that your starting quarterback is healthy enough to be active, but he's not healthy enough to start. Like, right, that's the bizarre part about it. That's the bizarre part about it. McVay showed that he would rather go with Wolford. But with Wolford not practicing this week due to the concussion from last week, I think he's going with – I think they've got to go with Goff again. Well, you know the, that the Rams have paid Goff. They've paid Donald. They've paid Ramsey. When it comes cap casualty time, this might be one of the first times that we'll see the quarterback be the one on the chopping block as opposed to the defensive players. It's it's not a crazy possibility. All right. The other thing I did want to throw out uh, in the Rams' favor, you mentioned that the Rams, you know, if they could kind of stalemate the Packers' offense, one way that they could do that would be uh, the one – coverage that Rodgers hasn't absolutely destroyed this year, which is split safety zones. So you're cover two, cover four, cover six, uh, combo coverages. The Rams do a ton of that and they do it well. We mentioned last week that they were the best cover three team in the league over the second half of the year. Their real identity is as a split safety zone team. Uh, it should be awesome to watch what they do, how often they go with the double teams against Devontae Adams. I think they're going to mix it up. Maybe if they can keep two safeties high, then they, they'd have a way to kind of hang with the Packers, like you were saying. But on paper, oof. I think they want to do the two safeties high because they're the number one defense in the league against deep passes. And that suggests the two safeties high, certainly. It'll be a good game. But I think the game that we're really looking forward to on Saturday is the Ravens against the Bills at 815. Number five Ravens at the number two Bills. Uh, what are you looking forward to in this one? Yeah, this is fabulous. So the Bills are still number one in weighted DVOA, but Baltimore is sixth in weighted DVOA. And I think what makes this really interesting is the Baltimore offense had improved so much over the last few weeks, but the Baltimore defense had declined over the last few weeks. 
And they really turned that around with a fantastic game against Tennessee. And that makes this really exciting because if Baltimore is kicking on both offense and defense, and the Buffalo defense has also improved in the last few weeks, what you have here is two teams where everything is going well, including special teams, uh, playing against each other should just be phenomenal. Getting away from the stats just for a second, these are two teams that are, that are the definition of what you don't want to face in the playoffs. They are both at their core physically tough teams that really just try to beat you up strong offensive lines yeah. strong offensive lines strong in the front seven on both sides especially now like you mentioned with with baltimore getting healthier on defense seeing the difference that brandon williams and clays campbell being healthy in there make for them this is just this is going to be a, a slugfest this is going to be a classic football game i i think it's it's basically a toss-up now one thing i looked at that i was surprised by was that the bills number one in weighted dvoa right now you could look at a stat like that and say, okay, recently the Bills have been the best team. But I think if you kind of extend your purview a little bit longer and you look at, you know, take the going into the season, take what we thought of these teams into account. And I think that, that the, the quote unquote analytics would have a kind of different perspective on the game. I, I don't know which way this one. Well, that's because we didn't know Josh Allen was going to turn into what Josh Allen turned into. I mean, in, in Football Outsiders Almanac, we basically wrote, Buffalo is the best team in the league aside from the quarterback position. I think everybody knew that Buffalo had good coaching, good management, good talent all around the field. The question was the quarterback, and that question has apparently been answered. I mean, I think going into this season, if we had known that Josh Allen would suddenly blossom, we wouldn't be seeing this game as exactly as we're seeing it now, which is two really good teams in every way because Baltimore looked super strong coming off last year and Buffalo looked, you know, except the quarterback looked super strong coming off last year. So there are kind of a bunch of strengths against strengths in this game. When you look at the Buffalo passing game, their receivers lining up against that Baltimore secondary. Uh, one thing that I looked at that you would think, how do you attack Baltimore it might be passing against their linebackers, trying to target the running backs against them. The loss of Cam Akers, though, I think offsets that from a Bills standpoint. Uh, sorry, Zach Moss, not Cam Akers. Sorry, uh, that flipped the two in my brain sometimes. But Devin Singletary uh, can do some things in the passing game, but really is the only guy left in the backfield that you're going to be counting on in that sense. So I wonder if that maybe kind of tilts things a little bit or if ultimately at the end of the day, we're just going to continue to see more and more of the Bills using Josh Allen as their main running back. Baltimore average against running backs in the passing game, which means relatively that's a weakness, but it's not really a weakness. I, I heard you talking on the uh, the football outsiders, the edge sports preview of this game, talking about Buffalo's need to pass on first down. And I couldn't agree with you more on that one. Josh Allen leads the NFL, 25 passing points earned on first downs. Uh, that said, the Ravens had the second best first down pass defense in the league by expected points added. Uh, behind only the Washington football team, and they were first in pass defense points saved on first downs. So another fantastic strength-on-strength strength matchup there. By the way, flip it around, and it's not a strength-on-strength strength matchup. This would be a good time for Baltimore to pass the ball first on first downs. We know that they're very run first, but they were fifth in DVOA passing on first downs, while the Bills' defense, despite being fairly strong all around, was only 26th against the pass on first down. Very, very interesting. I'm uh, I'm really, really excited to see Tremaine Edmonds. And I mean, after his game last week, he was fantastic. I'm interested to see how he fits in and how the Bills defense fits around him in terms of facing up against Lamar Jackson. He'll obviously have his, his hands full, but if there's anybody who kind of switches the way some matchups work out, whether they're using him to try to, to try to negate the tight end, Mark Andrews, or whatever, whatever the matchup sort of is, I'll, I'll be really looking forward to see how Buffalo comes out and tries to defend what their plan is to stop that, that different Lamar Jackson-based offense. Yeah, this game really is a toss-up. The Off the Charts Football Podcast is free, and if you like free stuff, you should check out SISDataHub.com, our free football advanced stats website. SISDataHub.com has a brand new game logs feature where you can see a selection of advanced stats for each player game by game. This includes our flagship metric, total points. Now you can see how well players have performed at earning points for their teams in individual games over the past five NFL seasons. The free SISDataHub.com is your source for the most accurate and objective football analytics in NFL history. 
The new game logs are just one of many planned improvements as we roll out new features. Check out SISDataHub.com today and tweet us at sportsinfo underscore SIS to let us know what you think. All right, let's move forward to Sunday. Going back to one of these games with uh, a buy plus probably uh, the top quality team in the league, uh, by my opinion at least, uh, the Chiefs. The Browns have a tough matchup at 3 o'clock on Sunday. They'll be heading to Kansas City, coming off the emotional win, huge win against the Steelers. What are you looking forward to in this one? Well, I mean, listen, look, I've been driving the storyline that Kansas City might be a little overrated for weeks now, and I still am a believer in that. The idea that Kansas City is the strongest team in the league is based on a lot of subjective stuff that we haven't actually seen in real life. Like, we believe that they can just turn a light switch on and off because they were really good in the playoffs last year. But the fact is the teams that play as many close games as them, and, and those are not all games where they lost leads late in the first, you know, not lost leads, but like where teams scored on them late in the fourth quarter where it didn't matter. I mean, like Atlanta was a close game the whole time. Carolina was a close game the whole time. All of that stuff suggests a team that is not as strong as people think it is, except they have a bye week and Cleveland is the weakest team left in the playoffs and everything Cleveland's good at Kansas. It's like, these are the two worst defenses left in the playoffs, but Cleveland is worse than Kansas city and the Cleveland offense has been super hot, but they're not as good as Kansas city. So in every way, it's like, you know, I mean, I can talk about Kansas city, not being as good as people think, but Cleveland's not as good as Kansas city. So uh, I mean, the Cleveland offense put up their best offensive performance of the year in that game against Pittsburgh. Like, it wasn't just Roethlisberger throwing picks. Like, their offense was totally on point. The last six games, if you skip week 16 when all their receivers were on the COVID list, Cleveland has an offensive DVOA of 33%, which would be number one for the whole year. But let's be honest, even as well as they've played in the last few weeks, who has the better offense of these two teams? It's Kansas. I'm with you on, on all of those points. I think you really sum it up. Even if, I mean, the, the whole, I, I said, I like the Chiefs. I think they're the most talented team that's left in the playoffs. I still wouldn't take them against the field, even at this point. Give me another week, at least on that one. I look at their offensive line. And when, I, when it comes down to, you know, the way that we think about this team and Tyree Kill and Kelsey and Mahomes, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about Mike Remmers and Andrew Wiley. Um, you know, Nick Allegretti. They've had some players that have had some struggles up front this year. You know, it goes back to opt outs that they've had that have affected their lineup. It goes back to injuries. Osa Mele replaced uh, Lauren, uh, Lawrence D- uh, Duvernay Tardif when Duvernay Tardif opted out, and then Osa Mele got hurt. It's been a rough season, really, for this Kansas City offensive line. So um, I look at I look at the matchups there, and I say, if there's anywhere that it's going to fall apart, it's going to be there. It's going to be on the edge against Miles Garrett. It's going to be that sort of thing where... Which means the Browns will miss Olivier Vernon a lot because they could really use having both edges. No doubt about it. Maybe the Browns... Hey, the Browns are actually getting healthier. They played their game last week without their corners. I think they'll probably need the likes of Denzel Ward back in there this game, who, by the way, it sounds like was pretty sick just about two weeks ago. So it'd be interesting to see what kind of shape he's in. But I'm with you on that one. If we're, if we're going to talk about the Chiefs and be a little bit more uh, measured about it, we've got to be realistic about this offensive line. It is a weakness on this football team. I agree with that. I mean, the problem is, I mean, I've recited this on Twitter. Cleveland's uh, weaknesses, biggest weaknesses on defense are the exact wrong weaknesses against the Kansas City. 29th against deep passes. 28th against tight ends. 28th on third down. And this is the one I found yesterday. Patrick Mahomes, the best DVOA in the league this year on blitzes, and this is not a one-year thing. He's like this every year. Brown, 30th with blitzes. Do not blitz Mahomes. I think that's safe to say. If you if you can't get home with your front four against their offensive line, uh, you don't have a chance of beating them anyway. So forget about that. Yeah. I mean, I think Cleveland will get some good running on Kansas City. Uh, I will point out they're better running earlier in the series. They're third running on first down, 18th on second, 28th on third. But I think against this run defense, they can get some running yards. And I think they're going to get some offense. I expect this to go over, even though it's a really high over under of like 56 and a half or something. I expect this to go over, but I just, I mean, I just, I think Kansas City's better and they've got the bye week. And even if I don't think Kansas City's as good as everyone else thinks they are, they're better than Cleveland. I'm I'm just expecting, and you know, and a larger point, 
these these two game there are only two teams that have buys this year. It's not as if every year when there were four buys that we saw four teams with buys win. Even though when you think about it, it almost seems like a home game plus a buy. It's just such a monumental advantage. And being the number one seed means you get to play the weaker of the other teams. So and you were the best team all year. Yeah. <laughs> so there are lots of reasons that go into it. But once again, man, with the rule changes this year, only two teams, the number one seed is just so colossal because if you can win just two home games, you're there versus having to win three games, period. Even if it's two home and one road, I, I think it's a big deal. It would be a huge shakeup if we saw one of these two six seeds make it into the uh, conference championship games. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no doubt that this weekend looks like there's two games that are pretty likely to be won by the home team and two games that are just totally up in the air. Right. I think Vegas has these games as more than a touchdown and the other games is less than a field goal. Yeah, Green Bay is only six and a half right now, which surprises me. I would have expected it to be more. That is interesting. A lot of faith in that Rams defense, I guess. Yeah, Kansas City is a 10. Which feels about right. And you might even think about start taking the points at that point. I, I would I would take the points at that point, given that Kansas City hasn't hasn't won by more than a touchdown since week eight. All right. Let's go to the last game of the week. And one of the ones that I think is uh, considered much more of a toss up. And this is a tough one for DVOA. Um, I know this is two teams that DVOA has been all over all year. They're facing each other too early. The number five bucks at the number two Saints. What do you think here, Aaron? Right, the top two teams by DVOA for the whole season, although in weighted DVOA, they're three and four. And I think this is a fabulous matchup. I will say Tampa Bay's offense is on fire. They're second since week 10, trailing only Green Bay. They have not had a negative offensive DVOA since that week nine blowout against the Saints, while the Saints have had negative offensive DVOA in two of four games since Drew Brees' return. So that's not even looking at the Taysom Hill games. And I think this is going to be very different. You know, when these two teams played in the regular season, it was week one and week nine. So, you know, we're having these like evenly spaced out increments of time. But over that time, the Bucs have changed a ton. And I think really at this point, this is Tom Brady's offense. I think the evidence is on the film when, when you look at what they're doing. Yes, there's elements of Bruce Arians. Yes, you see them trying to stretch vertically some. But a lot of the time, this is Tom Brady doing Tom Brady stuff that, that we've seen him do for years. So from a Saints perspective, I think as you game plan in this one, you're looking at a lot of Patriots film, Tom Brady. You're looking at a lot of your game plans that you would, if you were going against these Belichick, Josh McDaniels teams, to go along with just looking at the tape of what the Bucks have been doing this year. I think there'll be some answers um, buried in the, in the Patriots playbook when it comes to what you can expect from the Bucks this week. I will say I rewatched the first half of the blowout from week nine, and that game was a lot closer in the first half than we may remember. There were multiple plays where Brady just missed his guy. And don't forget that Jared Cook fumbled at the goal line. So, I mean, in a way, it could have been even stronger for the Saints. But just when Tampa was on offense, like Brady didn't look bad at first. Like at first, he was just missing guy. And then, and then the, the pressure really started to get to him. And I think pressure is the way to go. Now, this is the opposite of what I said about Patrick Mahomes. But this is the second straight year that Brady struggled against the Blitz. So their team pass DVOA dropped from 42% to minus 4% with a Blitz. And the Saints defense improved from minus 11 to minus 38 with a Blitz. So the opposite of what I said about Mahomes, this might be the best thing is for the Saints to blitz Brady. I think uh, Dennis Allen will probably oblige. I think they're going to come with a lot of different looks uh, as you have to against Tom Brady. But I think you're right that there'll be some blitzing in there. Just how the, the impact of Ali Marpet and how they've played kind of with and without him. Yes, there was no Marpet in the first game. Having him in there, I think, is a, is a big deal for this team in terms of their ability to protect and then, man, I know it's easy to think about on, you know, on paper, you think about these teams and the Saints and their high powered offense um, and how good they've been in terms of their improvement on defense over the past couple of years. But really, I think if you put the depth charts up against each other, I think this might be favorable to the Buccaneers in a lot of ways. And certainly right now, I would take Tom Brady over Drew Brees just based on based on the, the physical factors. You don't see the limitations in Tom Brady's game that you are seeing emerge with Drew Brees that make me think that he might be in the broadcast booth next year. 
And more importantly, I would take Tom Brady's weapons over Drew Brees' weapons. These are both very strong offensive lines. Especially up the middle. But I would take, you know, forget about Mike Evans and Michael Thomas for a moment. And obviously Kamara is better than like Ronald Jones, or I guess it's going to be Leonard Fournette since Jones is injured. But I would much rather uh, be throwing to Gronk and Chris Godwin and Antonio Brown and Scotty Miller than Traquan Smith if he's healthy and Mickey Calloway or Montez Calloway or whatever his name is. Right. It gets really thin after number one. Jared Cook and Lil Jordan Humphrey, who's the cutest of all the Jordan Humphreys. I, I think given, given that, though, given the weapons that Tampa Bay has – and I, I think the defense, uh, you know, if you wanted to call it a wash defensively, I probably wouldn't argue with you. Given all of that, Sean Payton might come with kind of a, a more conservative approach here. It might be the Sean Payton that we've seen in the last two years and not the Sean Payton that we think of in our heads, which is a lot of Kamara and a lot of short stuff and ball control. I think ball control will be a key for New Orleans. Right. But both these run defenses have been outstanding this year. So, and come, and as far as uh, Tampa Bay is sixth against running backs in the passing game. So like, it's not even set up to be a big game for Kamara as far as the qualities of the Tampa Bay defense. And you just made me think, I mean, those, those Tampa Bay linebackers we've talked about before, Levante David and Devin White, if you want to attach the blitzing, like you were saying before to those linebackers, Devin White's been such a good blitzer this year. Well, I don't know about blitzing Breeze. I definitely think the Saints should be blitzing Brady. But yes, their Tampa Bay blit the Tampa Bay, as far as them blitzing Breeze, like Tampa Bay has been really good when they send one of those inside linebackers, and Devin White will finally be back. Interesting matchups uh, on both sides of the ball there in terms of uh, will they blitz, will they not? One thing that uh, you mentioned in the Edge Sports preview, the CCI index, the coaching index, just 30th and 32nd in terms of fourth down decision making. Should we expect some bad fourth down decisions in this one? Unfortunately, yeah. Like, I don't know what happened to Sean Payton. Sean Payton is one of the 10 most aggressive coaches of the last 30 years, and he has gotten tremendously conservative over the last two years. And Arians has always been very conservative on fourth down. So, yeah, Buffalo-Baltimore is a game where I expect to see aggressive, smart decision-making on fourth down. And this is a game where I expect to see punts. It's interesting. Those, uh, those AFC teams you mentioned, two of the most forward-thinking analytics departments, no surprise to see them being aggressive. Not to say that the Bucks and Saints haven't been forward-thinking, but it's certainly a little bit less reliant on those sort of things and the way that they put together their game plans. Also want to give props, as long as we're giving props, to go back to the other games, Matt LaFleur also from Green Bay is very aggressive and forward-thinking. Well, I'll see how he does against his, his friend Sean McVay. Uh, that one should be a fascinating matchup to watch. Who is surprisingly conservative, McVeigh, by the way, on fourth down. It's not what you would think of given uh, what a forward thinker he is when it comes to scheming. I wonder how much Aaron Rodgers versus Jared Goff uh, contributes to the differences between them. Yeah, um, but with that offensive line and the running game, you know, they should be able to run for one. All right. Thank you to all of the listeners. Thank you for all your support. Please keep supporting the show. Keep the five-star reviews coming, especially on Apple Podcasts. It helps others find the podcast. You can find us on Twitter. He's at F-O underscore A-Shots, A-S-C-H-A-T-Z. I'm at Matt Mano, M-A-T-T-M-A-N-O. We are also on Instagram and YouTube. You can search for Sports Info Solutions. At SIS, we are starting to pump out some of the SIS film breakdowns on different people that you need to learn about coming up in the 2021 NFL draft and players that will be featured in the SIS football rookie handbook. I saw the first ad for the handbook, yeah. First ad for the handbook is out, and uh, we're excited about it. We're, uh, we're hard at work on it, and uh, it'll be due to the publisher in less than a month So, and, and on shelves shortly thereafter, so we're excited for it. There will be a Kindle edition, an ebook version of the book this year, which is exciting too, because that means it'll come out much quicker. Basically, as soon as we get it into the publisher, it'll be back out and available in ebook form. So uh, we're looking forward to that this year. Football Outsiders. Aaron, what can the listeners find on footballoutsiders.com this week? Besides that excellent edge sports video breakdown that that looked at the games coming up this week we've got that we've got word of mouth on the protection for josh allen against indianapolis and why it was so good props for a devin singletary there the running back also a film room on the ravens defense and how they shut down the titans and improved and then final fei college football ratings which 
is sort of an interesting article about what you do when teams don't play each other. Like the FEI ratings look very weird this year because there was no interplay between conferences. And it's sort of an interesting thought exercise about how to deal with the lack of connectivity in college football this year. Yeah, it's hard to do uh, defense-adjusted statistics when you don't have teams play each other. Right, so he ends up with teams from like the Sun Belt and MAC in like the top 25 just because there weren't enough games between conferences. And then the Sun Belt went, what, like 3-0 and against the Big 12? So when they did play the higher conferences, they won. So it like makes the, the interplay of the – so like it brings up this question like is Alabama as good – as their numbers say they are like, cause all these advanced ratings have Alabama as if not the greatest team of all time, one of the greatest teams of all time. But how do you judge that when you don't know the quality of who they played because you don't know the quality of who those teams play? I would say that they're, they're the national champions. There's certainly no asterisk there, but everything else about this season is a huge asterisk. And can, so that's why, I mean, in terms of considering them one of the best teams of all time, I'm sorry, we can't consider anything from this year one of the best anythings. Right. I mean, best team of this year, pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, on the Sports Info Solutions side, you can check out sportsinfosolutionsblog.com and check out the free SIS Data Hub by visiting sisdatahub.com. We've got the new Game Logs feature. From my co-host Aaron Schatz and our producer Justin Stein, I'm Matt Manicharian, and thank you for joining us for the latest episode of the Off the Charts Football Podcast. <laughs>